All right, good morning. I want to welcome you to Howard's Creek this morning. It is great to have you with us. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our series, Summer in the Psalms, and we are going to be looking at Psalm 96 today. We are going to jump right into the text. And so if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 96, and while you turn there, I just want to pose a few questions to you. What do you spend the majority of your time talking about? If you, you looked at last week, what was the dominant topic in which you spoke about last week? Or let me ask you this. What, what gets you excited? The things that we talk most often about are the things that we care most about. If, if we want to know what our minds are thinking, we look at what our lips are saying. If you looked at me, um, I, I used to love to talk about sports. Um, back when we had that thing on TV I could watch, I, I really enjoyed sports. And, and I would talk about, you know, Carolina basketball. Next year is going to be our year. I talk about app football. Uh, I love to talk about ham biscuits because I care a lot about ham biscuits. I love to talk about my wife. And unlike what you hear up here a lot, I, I love her. And I talk really good about her most of the time. And uh, I love to talk about uh, my kids. What we love, we love to share. And so if you want to know what your heart loves, I want you to think about what, what is your mouth speaking about? As you consider that, let me pose another question to you this morning. Do you notice a lack of excitement about God in our society today? Do you, do you notice a lack of excitement about God in our churches often today? And let me ask you the question, why do you think that is? And, and as you consider that, I, I would think because we are, we're no longer captivated by the, the greatness and the glory of God. Now let me ask you another question. Why are you here? Not, not why are you here at Howard's Creek, but why are you here on this earth? Why do you exist? And if we study that, I believe the reason why we exist is to know God, to know him in relationship, to worship God, and to make him known. Now, now David is going to tie all three of these themes together this morning for us. And in Psalm 96, we'll see that he is captivated by God's glory, which leads him to this place of worship. And, and this place of worship leads him to live out his mission, to make God known. And so we're going to look at it this morning. Psalm 96, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to begin in verse 1. Before we, we read, if you'll bow with me, let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would give us a renewed affection, a renewed excitement for your glory, that you would open up our eyes to see you and our ears to hear from you this morning. Father, we pray that as you reveal yourself to us, that, that we would respond with worship and that our worship would lead us to live out the mission of making you known on this earth. Our Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, Psalm 96, verse 1. David says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. And so in those first three verses, he says, Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. So let me ask you a question this morning. How often do you sing to the Lord? Check out the, a few of these commands. Exodus fifteen twenty one says, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Psalm 147, verse 1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Verse 7, he says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. Psalm 149, verse 1, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Verse 5, he says, let the godly exult or, or celebrate in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Zechariah 2.10, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. James 5.13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Ephesians 5.19, after he says, be filled with the Spirit, he says, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Just a few examples, but we see this. In just those examples from Exodus to James, throughout Scripture, this command to sing to the Lord. And so why are we commanded to sing to the Lord? Okay, well, one of the reasons is, is, is what we sing about shapes what we value and what we long for. Okay. And so I want you to think about that. Think about the things that you sing about. Does that not speak of things in which you value and things in which maybe you're longing for? And so with this understanding of how our singing shapes our values and what we long for, you know, we don't want to spend our days singing about friends in low places or Margaritaville. We want, we want to spend our days singing 
about a God who has infinite value. We want to we want to sing because we want our hearts to long for Jesus Christ. Okay, and another reason in which we sing is because music has a healing effect on us. Okay, music is often used in therapy. Music um, therapy treats different disorders such as Parkinson's disease, memory loss, traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Think about Saul when he was afflicted by, by the evil spirit. What did they do? They sent for David, and David came, and, and he played for him. And as he played for him, we, we see that uh, Saul is refreshed, and the evil spirit leaves him. The, the healing effect of music. Music is a gift, a gift that we can offer to our creator as we sing his praises. When we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, when we are singing the word of God, it allows us to engage emotionally with the word of God. When we gather together and we sing to the Lord together, it brings unity among the body as well. Singing is an eternal activity. It is something that we will continue to do for all of eternity as believers in Christ. We will, we will gather around his throne and we will sing about how worthy is this lamb who was slain. And, and so I want to encourage us that we cultivate a daily practice of singing to the Lord. He says, sing, sing, sing. And then he says, tell of his salvation, declare among the nations. I want you to see the connection here. He's, he, he's encouraging us in this element of worship to the Lord through singing. And, and then what authentic worship leads to is authentic missions. Okay. As we get excited and we delight in God, it should leave us, lead us to go out and to tell of his salvation, to declare it among the nations. Understand something. You're not going to be a good missionary if you're not a good worshiper. And vice versa, you're not going to be a good worshiper if you're not seeking to live out the mission, you're not going to be a true worshiper if you're not seeking to live out the mission. Think about it. Why do we share Christ with people? Because we want them to experience this incredible relationship in which we found. We want them to experience this amazing gift of salvation. We want to, them to experience this God who satisfies and fulfills. We want them to experience and delight in the greatness that is, is our God. And so if, if we're not passionate about that, we're not going to be effective as a missionary. As well, if we are passionate and excited about that, why would we not be seeking to share it with everyone? And so I want us to see that worship and missions go together. And so as, as we go through this, we're going to see this is a common theme in Psalm 96. And so before we dive in, I just want you to evaluate your life. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself as a worshiper of God, as, as spending your days on this earth worshiping God? 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest. As well, I want you to evaluate how, how well are you doing at living out the mission of making Christ known on this earth? Okay, if the answer to those two things was, was 10 on both, you, you're dismissed. Have a great day. I'll see you next week. If it was anything less than a 10, I want you to dial in. I want you to focus because Dave is going to show us how we can improve from here. Verse 4, he says, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. I love this. He says, For great is the Lord and greatly or worthy to be praised. He's to be feared above all other gods. You're thinking, I thought there were no other gods. There are. And keep reading verse 5. He says, all other gods are worthless idols. Okay, and so when I ask you that question, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate your, your worship of God? If you were anything less than a 10, I would say probably the reason you're anything less than a 10 is because you've been worshiping worthless idols. Because understand something, we are worshipers. That's the way we were created. We're worshiping something. And if you're not worshiping God fully, it's probably because we've allowed ourselves to worship idols. And we talked about idols a little bit last week. These things that take our affection and our focus off, off of God and, and focus on these things. And so if we want to expose the idols in our heart, we look at the things where we focus our time, where we focus our attention, where we focus our money, where we focus our affections. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's your job that you look to to validate you. Maybe it's a relationship in which you're looking to. Maybe it's um, your image because you're looking for the approval of other people. Uh, maybe it's sports. Maybe it's one of those things we talked about last week, money or consumerism or entertainment. Maybe it's comfort or security, or maybe it's your phone. The question is what consumes you and, and what captivates you? That's what you worship. And, and David is pleading with us this morning. Why would you Go after worthless idols 
when we have this incredible God who is so great and so amazing and so worthy to be praised? Why would you spend your days on this earth staring at your phone when you could be worshiping this amazing God? He told us last week that, that these idols, they will multiply your sorrows. You, you, you live your life chasing these idols, they will multiply your misery. They will leave you sorrowful in the end. And so he's continuing this theme of helping us to understand why would we give ourselves to that? Our, our few days that we have on this earth, why, w- why would we not give them to this God who is so worthy to be worshipped and pursued and praised? I love his argument here. He, he contrasts these worthless idols. To, he says, but God made the heavens. Why would we consume ourselves in the worship of, of athletes or celebrities or entertainment when we could consume ourselves in worship of a God who has created the heavens, who has created this earth, who has created a universe so big that astronomers can't find the ends to it? We have this incredible God. Why would we, why would we go after him and consume ourselves with worthless idols when we could worship him? A God who is the creator of all things. Not only the creator, he is the sustainer. If he removes his hand, everything crumbles. Not only a God who has such power, but a God who is filled with such love and mercy. Why would we not consume ourselves in worshiping him? I'll give you a little homework today. I want you to go home and I want you to read Job 38 through 41. Just to kind of put things back in perspective when we evaluate what is it we're going to give our lives to worship. I want you to read that text. And, and in that text, God is speaking to Job and he's, he's kind of just, just telling it, laying it out there for him. He's you know, explaining listen, who, who's sovereign here? Who's in control? Who's running the show? And, and he asked Job a series of questions. You know, like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Remind me again, Job, who, who is it that sets the boundaries of the ocean and tells it where to stop? Who, who is it that commands the sun when to rise and commands the sun to set? Who is it that commands it to rain? Who is it that tells the lightning where to strike? Who, who is that, Job? Who, who's the one who, who give, gives wisdom to the inward parts? Who gives insight and understanding to the mind? Okay. Who is it that is sovereign and taking care of all of these things? And as we stop and we step back and we evaluate that, a God who is sovereign and in complete control, and we ask ourselves the question, what is it that we're going to give our lives to worship? How foolish would it be to go after these worthless idols? And David's pleading with us, no, no, no. May we bring ourselves to worship this God. He is great and he is worthy to be praised. David Foster Wallace says, we're all dying to give our lives away to something to God or Satan, politics or grammar, to games or needles, or maybe to another person. I thought about that quote, and I think it's true. There's a lot of truth in that. We are. We just seem to be dying to give ourselves to something, to be consumed in something. So I want you to think about that for you. What is it that you are so seeking to be consumed by? And whatever you answer that with, that's what you worship. And if that answer is anything other than Christ, David is pleading with you this morning in Psalm 96. And that you would turn from that, that you would repent from that, and that you would give yourselves wholly and completely to worshiping this God who is worthy of our praise. Verse 7, he says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Now that word ascribe is a little bit unfamiliar with us, but that word ascribe means to come, to give, to attribute. And so if we put that in, in those terms, he's saying to us, Come to the Lord, O families of the people. When I ask you to evaluate yourself on your level of worship, if it was lacking, here's the remedy. Then you need to come to the Lord. Okay, you need to seek him and pursue him. You, what is the predominant way in which he reveals himself to us? It's the word of God. Then you need to be a student of the word. You need to study it daily, seeking to take it in and understand it and grow in your knowledge of God, of who he is, of his character and what he's done. And, and then you want to continue to study him in, in, in prayer in circumstances, in, in God's people. He says, a tribute to the Lord, glory and strength. In other words, recognize the glory and strength of God. Step back and evaluate the, the glory that God beholds, his holiness, his righteousness, and, and, and behold his power that he speaks in the universe that comes into existence. Behold his power as we watch him work throughout scripture. Behold his sovereignty. And as we consider that, why would we spend all of last week talking about a virus or talking about sports? Why would we not consume ourselves in talking about this? God, that's what he says next. Give to God the glory that he's due. Why would I live my short time on this earth trying to talk so much about myself when there's a God who's worthy to be spoken of and praised to? He continues, verse 9, bring the, excuse me, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. 
Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And so we see this continual theme here. He says, worship the Lord and then say it among the nations. We, we, we see this theme throughout Psalm 96 of worship and then missions. How our worship and getting excited about God should lead us to take this mission, to, to, to tell others uh, about his sovereign rule. He said, what should we tell them? That, that God, God reigns, that he rules, that he's sovereign over all things, that he's creator, sustainer, and yet he's also our redeemer. Verse 2, he said, tell of this salvation from day to day. We tell about this incredible gift of salvation, how we were enemies of his, and yet he came and redeemed us through Christ into relationship with him, into an inheritance of his kingdom. And so let me ask you this question this morning. Has your affection for your own salvation or your excitement for your own salvation, has it transferred into a passion to telling others about Christ? As you consider what Christ has done for you, has it led you to this place of, of, of excitement to go and take it and tell other people about who Christ is and what he's done? Has it led you to this place where you, you want to take this message and you want to say it among the nations, you want to declare it? Do you know that there are, according to the Joshua Project, over 6,000 unreached people groups in our world today? Over 6,000 unreached people groups, which translates into over 3 billion unreached people. These are people who will be born, they will live, and they will die and never hear the gospel. And David is saying to us this morning, declare it among the nations. Say this among the nations. Tell of this salvation. And it's not just David that's telling us this this morning. Our king, Jesus, said to us, go make disciples of all nations, of all people groups. He says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We have been called to take this message to the world. And so as we get to this part in the text, I want us to, to examine that. I want to challenge you to do three things. First is to go, to pray about this, to seriously pray. Is God calling you to go and be a missionary to these unreached people groups? And, and if the answer is yes, we want to do all we can to support you and, and guide you in this. If the answer is no to that, let me tell you where God is calling you to be a missionary. If he's not calling you to the unreached people groups, he's calling you to the place where he's put you right now. He's calling you to be a missionary of his greatness, of his salvation, of his marvelous works to your school or to your workplace or to your family, to the places in which he's put you to make much of him there. The second thing I want to encourage you with after go is to give. If God's not calling you to, to be a missionary to these unreached people groups, I would encourage us to give, to support them financially, okay? To give and to give generously so that the gospel would be taken among the nations. And the third thing I want to challenge you to do after go, after give, is that we pray. We talk about this a lot. The most powerful tool we have available to us is prayer, to ask God to intervene. He can accomplish more in two seconds than we can in 200 years. And so we want to ask him to raise up missionaries. And we want to ask him to, to, to establish these Bible translation projects into these unreached people groups. We want him to make his glory known among the nations. And so we're going to ask him to work and move in a powerful way. He continues, verse 11. He says, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faith, faithfulness. And so the psalmist is calling for all of creation to worship God. He's, he's telling the earth and, and the things within the earth, worship God because he's coming back. And he's coming back to restore. He's, he's also coming back to judge. Now that's bad news for us because he's coming back to judge in righteousness. And the reason that's bad news is because we have not met his standard of righteousness. Okay, we've, we've not met his mark of righteousness. This is the cool thing about Psalm 96 is it's driving us to the gospel. In verse 4, he told us that God is to be feared. Verse 5, he talked about worthless idols. Think about that. We've all gone after those worthless idols. And so then when he tells us in verse 13 that he's coming back to judge in righteousness, then we should all really be fearing because, because we have gone after these idols instead of living our lives in complete and total worship of God, then when he comes to judge in righteousness, since we've not met his standard, we're going to be cast into a lake of fire to, to be eternally separated from God. 
to be eternally separated from his goodness, to be enduring God's wrath, his justice for our sin for all of eternity because he's a just God. But what if, just, just dream with me for a second, what if this God that we've been talking about who is so worthy of our praise, what if he was also loving? Like, like not loving like we love. I'm talking about like unconditional loving, like he loved his enemies. And, and, and so what if he was also secure? Okay, so even though as his enemies we've been worshiping idols and uh, these things, instead of worshiping him, we chose to worship these worthless idols instead. What if he was so secure and so loving that, that he decided he wanted to redeem us? And what if he was also so intelligent that he came up with a plan that he could still maintain his justice yet provide us a way of redemption? And so in this plan, he, he, let's just say he sends his son into this world to live up to this standard of righteousness that was required for relationship with God. To, he met the mark of righteousness. This son who, who has the same love and this same affection for us would come and live this life of righteousness. And let's just say that he's also gracious and merciful and was willing to go to a cross for us. Okay, th- think about this. Th- this son who we should have been worshiping, but instead we chose to turn from him, to reject him, to rebel from him, to worship idols, would come and live the life that we couldn't live, to go to a cross to take on our idolatry where we should have been worshiping him, he's going to pay for that? The thing, and, and God would pour out his justice, his punishment for our idolatry onto his son? This is scandalous. But, but just think with me for a second. What if he did that? <laughs> And his son died in our place, suffering God's punishment for our sin. And then he's dead for three days, but that's not enough. This God who has been so secure and intelligent and loving and merciful and gracious for us, we also need him to be powerful because if if the son stays dead, we have no hope for our resurrection. We need him to conquer death for himself and for us. And yet, what if that happened? What if he conquered death? He he defeated death, hell, sin, and the grave, and he came back to life. And then what if he, this God, this I can't can't wrap my mind around a God that could be all these things and do all these things, but what if he offered to us that if we would embrace him as our Lord, that we would repent of our idolatry and commit to following him and worshiping him, that he would forgive us of that idolatry, past, present, future. He would impart the righteousness of, of his son upon our lives. What if he did that? What, what would you do? Because this is the good news of the gospel. He did that. We know this through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what has been accomplished for us. And so the question for us this morning is, what do we do in response to that? Well, the, the wise thing to do would be to repent of our idolatry and to em- embrace Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, to commit our lives to worshiping him. You know, as we consider what he's done, his marvelous works, it should lead us that we just want to give ourselves completely to worshiping him. As we give ourselves completely to worshiping him, that's going to lead us to this heart for missions that the world may know how incredible and great and awesome our God is. As I seek to land this plan, I want you to consider this. What is your life worshiping? We, we all, we're all worshiping something. So what is it? What is your life worshiping right now? What, what is your life giving glory to? Is it your job? Your kids? Is it yourself? I want to challenge us this morning, if, if that was anything other than Jesus, that we would repent. That we would repent of, of that idolatry. And that we would commit ourselves to, to seeking to worship Christ with everything we have. Because he is great and, and worthy to be praised. And that we would live lives. You know, you think about the things that, that, that maybe you would have named there. Think about how you worship them. What do you do? You get up early for them. You, you think about them all day long. You spend time with them in the evenings. What, what if that was our approach to our worship of Christ? We got up early to spend time in his word, to hear from him. We committed ourselves to prayer, to meditating upon him throughout the day, to memorizing his word, to, to seeking to be obedient to the leading of his spirit. And then every opportunity, God, we look for more opportunities in which to spend with him and to focus upon him, to serve him, to make much of him. Look, as we close this service, the the best thing I feel like we could do 
after looking at a text like this is to take some time to sing to the Lord, to take some time to worship. And so in just a second, I'm going to pray for us, and Hannah's going to come up, and Hannah's going to, going to sing with our praise team, and I want to invite you to, to flip your notes page over, and you'll see the lyrics of what she's going to sing, and I just want to invite you to worship with her, to worship the Lord because he is greatly to be praised. If you'll bow with me, let's pray. Father, I pray you expose any idols in our life. And as your spirit exposes that, I pray that you would give us a heart of repentance this morning and a heart that is committed to worshiping you. Father, I I pray that we would understand our purpose, a purpose of, of knowing you and living in relationship with you. If anybody has never entered that relationship this morning, that they would ask you to forgive them of their sin, of their unrighteousness, of their idolatry and that they would commit their lives to you. And if they do that, that they, would, that they would share that with us afterwards just so we can rejoice and celebrate and pray for them. Father, for those who, who have made that commitment, I just pray that you would give us a renewed affection and desire for your glory, for your greatness, that we would commit our days upon this earth to worshiping you because, God, you are worthy. That, that, that through our worship and our delight and our enjoyment of you, that we would go and we would share your greatness in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families, in in the places you put us here, and then we would also seek to spread it among the nations. Father, as as Hannah and our praise team leads us this morning, I pray that you just draw our hearts to you to worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. No point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vein your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made every burning star Every painted sky you can 
that stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. Creek Church, you are sent. Have a blessed week.